Okay, welcome back, Jim. We are going through the Dart language tour, annotating the documentation with our combined, I don't know how many years of experience. It's at least three from me. <laughs> For me, it's about five to six years of experience. Okay, so collectively, we've got about a decade and hopefully I can, uh, I feel like the more I learn, the, the less I'm able to appreciate what it felt like when I was really learning this stuff for the first time, when I was like learning, like, let's say, um, not constructors, control flow statements. When, um, when I was doing control flow statements um, in Ruby um, and learning how, that, how, how all that worked, but it was pretty similar to um, like MATLAB had, I think, if else statements in college. So pretty basic logic, you know, uh, that's not just unique to programming, but you can get in like a logic course as well. I remember the very first programming course I've ever did didn't even have to do with a programming language. It was a design uh, control flow and just general logic course that delved into the logics of programming languages using just simple English syntax. And then the second course was an actual language course in c -sharp .net. So um, mm -hmm. they really set a good foundation for you at the university, taking these baby steps. Nice. OK, so control flow statements. Um, I'm going to break down the language of this. <laughs> so we talk about the flow. That's like the, the code path that your, your code takes, the path that your code takes is the code path. That's the, um, the way it flows. So you can have a, you know, a detour, you can go down the happy path, uh, the main flow. Um, and then in order to control that, you have these like little keywords like ill, if and else if um, for all that. Um, and then it says Dart supports the usual control flow statements. So if you're brand new to programming, um, <laughs> you should know that these are similar constructs, similar ideas in every single programming language that's out there, or most of them at least, I would imagine. True. Um, most programming languages execute from top to bottom. And mm -hmm. with control flow statements, you can deviate the path, the flow, if you will, to circle back around or loop multiple times or have conditionals like a fork in a road, if you will. You take one path A due to one condition, path B for another condition, and so on, mm -hmm. using a real life example. Nice. Um, yeah, so there's, there's more in-depth stuff at the end you can read more about, but we're just gonna go over, I think, this, this, uh, this um, language sample part. Um, it looks like there are three kind of ways it's broken down. Here's your conditionals you were talking about, the if, else, ifs. And then I would group these two together. This is the four where you're given, um, this is kind of, this one right here, some people may have seen this before. You start with like an initialized value, you give it a, a condition and then you increase it by one each time through the loop. So that's a for loop. Um, this one up here is more implicit where it's like, this is a list of objects and um, this is your local variable object. And it looks like, you know, however many there are, it's just gonna take each one at a time and go through them. Uh, so that's more, it seems like an object oriented type for loop, if you wanna say it that way. It's akin to a for each loop in C sharp or mm. JavaScript. Nice. And then the last one is a, a while, um, which is a different kind of like loop as well, um, where these two things are, are related, this condition, um, and then the increment, where eventually that won't be the case. Um, this is also like how you can do infinite loops, where you can say while true, do something, and it'll just do it yep. over and over and over. While whatever condition is true, mm -hmm. execute the body of the loop. Yeah. Um, one thing I've, I've really enjoyed about the Ruby programming language is 
that we have um, enumerables, um, which is um, like in, instead of instead of making like like for example, these two type um, for loops, you almost never see these in a Ruby application or Rails application. I've I've never seen them because you can just like call dot each or dot map, and you iterate over the the objects uh, themselves. And so you don't have to be so explicit, like this is what we're doing. We're going over each of each of these objects. Um, and it's 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 been nice in, in Ruby to do that, uh, to understand that. The only time I actually ever saw one of these was in a, a coding interview for a job offer. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was like, why are we why are we using this? It seems so irrelevant. Um, it's possible to use the base for loop if you want to specify the precise execution that you would like. For mm -hmm. example, the, the example on our screen here, what if you want to increment every other month or every third month or every single month that's divisible by three, for example, you can put that clause within the for loop. Mm -hmm. Nice, let's, um, let's go ahead and start trying this, some of this stuff out then. I'm going to open this up in a little dart pad and we'll take the lost connection to my headphones. Can you still hear me? I can. I okay. Good, good, good. Okay. And it just randomly decided to reconnect. All right. <laughs> So let's paste this in here um, and fix some formatting. Oops. No. Let's see, what would it have done if you just press enter? Yeah, see, that is what I thought. There we go. All right, that looks good right there okay um yeah it looks good but the year is not defined anywhere that's right and lucky for us it's telling us that let's define it in here somewhere so the year is what 2021 right now and <laughs> i just uh i'm really used to ruby right now so i didn't say what kind of variable this is well there's two ways we can do it what are the two ways jim var or an explicit declaration let's be explicit about it nice okay so we have ourselves an integer okay let's uh let's take a look one of the things um a lot of people i think are familiar with javascript um, i think in javascript with the control flow statements you don't necessarily have to have um, parentheses. It's only when you have, say, like another condition. Actually, if that was JavaScript, it'd be like that. Another condition or something like that. Um, or if that's just a variable where you need to like make sure things are like super clear or like the order of operations, you know, like a third condition, then we would have like, oh, maybe we want to group these these together and we would use parentheses. Um, but from what I've seen in, in Dart, if you don't have those parentheses, like it, it lets you know real fast, like this does not compute. Um, and that's something that takes a while to get used to when you're writing Dart or Flutter code is uh, in your conditionals to always wrap the thing in parentheses. So it's very clear. Um, otherwise this is pretty similar as the Dart docs say the usual what language do they use? The usual control flow statements, okay? Um, in, uh, in, yeah, so this is just like JavaScript where you have um, parentheses, or sorry, uh, curly braces that open the, um, the code block. And then we're doing something, we're printing. Um, this looks like it's just a string. So if I run this, our year is greater than 2001. So we are in the 21st century. Nice. And this time it's... And it prints exactly that. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
And then this is a personal style choice. Um, I've, I've never really liked whenever the second condition is kind of like nested in between the closing bracket and the next opening bracket uh, or brace. I'm sorry. Um, I agree with you. I personally prefer the else if or else clauses to be on the same level as the initial if. Yeah. So you would do something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Which it's kind of like, okay, if you're, why have an else if anyways? I mean, why not just do that? Yeah. If that fails, uh, this is still going to be evaluated if, isn't it? Correct. But now it becomes two independent if statements that will always execute rather than an else if where only mm -hmm. one condition executes. Okay. So maybe, maybe the logic isn't. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, because if the logic was true in both cases for some reason, um, then in this case, it would be, right? Because 2021 is greater than 2001, and it's also greater than um, 1901. So if we run this, it should print both. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so this logic isn't exactly true in <laughs> 20th century. Uh, we could say year is greater than 1901 and less than 2001 um, or something like that. So, but if we throw in that else if, like you said, um, then we'll run it. Yeah. So I didn't evaluate this one because this is considered part of this, um, this top block. I don't know what, right. the, gui what the design guide says, but um, I'm going to leave it like that for now, just because that's how they had it in the documentation there. Um, yeah, something else to note is else if is two separate words. There are some programming languages where your else if is like that. Do you know which language in that comes Python? From? It's uh, elif, e l i f. Oh, really? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so ugly. Can't do it. Okay, so something to be aware of there. I think a reason why certain styling guides put the else if nested like that is logically they say well else if is conditional to the if so mm -hmm. let's nest it they probably yeah. like that because this would still technically even with all this white space here it's still part of the same overall group of logic but it when it's separated like this it, it kind of looks like two separate blocks that may operate independently of each other so to help the human, I think that's why. Is that what you're saying? Yep. Nice. Okay. So yeah, the um, there's not a lot in this this simple part about the control flow statements. Um, anything else you want to point out, Jim? Looks very straightforward compared to other C syntax languages. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know why they don't put this in here, but you can have the else at the end. Something else. Okay, always close with a semicolon. So now it's year negative 50. And it's something else. There we go. Cool. Nice. Okay. Let's check out some of these for loops. Okay. This, um, this pasting I gotta figure out because it's, it's no fun. Okay. All right, now we got some space to work with. So we have our main function, we have a for loop here, it's supposed to be printing the objects. Already it's telling us we have an undefined name, flyby objects. Okay, um, let's define that. Now, if we say var flyby objects equals some string, okay, I don't know. Yeah, the string used in the for loop must implement iterable. So here's a nice learning opportunity by putting in uh, this is not necessarily the wrong variable type um, because it inferred the type, but now this is explicitly the wrong variable type. 
um, the way this is written earlier, I said, this is kind of like the object oriented for loop. Um, it needs to be um, something that implements iterable. So if you recall, we have the top level object is an object. And earlier we said, okay, maybe there's like a number and each one of these inherits, um, like something can be an int or something can be a double. Uh, likewise, there's a string. Um, the thing we're, we ultimately want is like a list or a map, like one of those things. Sure. And may, maybe in between there, there's a um, an object that's an iterable, or maybe it's like a, a module or, or some other way it gets its behavior, a mix-in of sorts. Um, that's not an actual class. That could be the case. Interface. Yeah, yeah. That's, oops, I'm getting different error messages. So let's view the docs. Here we go, for n of invalid type. Okay, the analyzer produces a diagnostic when the expression following n, so do we have an n expression? Yes, that's our n expression right there. For ob var object, n flyby objects. Okay, so the n is what sets it off. A type that is in a subclass of iterable. So what I said earlier was about the object, iterable. Now, is a subclass the same as a... Am I... Aaron, will you repeat that one more time? Yeah, one sec, my headphones are going out, one sec. Okay, can you hear me now? Barely. Yeah, so so my my question is like now is, much better. Yeah, is the um this language they're using is a subclass the same thing as a child class that inherits from a parent class? Yes, as they are synonyms. They are synonyms. Okay. So then in that case I'm expecting iterable probably to be somewhere parent class to other. child class to yeah. class to subclass yeah so something like this object iterable map so it needs to inherit from that um this this isn't clickable i don't know how much of a rabbit hole we want to go down um oh look it says map isn't a subclass of iterable and earlier i was i was saying maybe we could use a list or a map um there might be a different way to do that so you can iterate over the values or the keys, maybe, um, since since the the return type of values or keys on a map is going to be an array or a list, as we would call them in Dart. Um, okay, that's good. So so let's go see if we can implement this. So fly by objects. I think in the in the documentation. Didn't they, um, didn't they give us an example of that already? Yeah, let's just use the one from, um, from variables up here, all right? Okay, it's just right above us. There we go. Okay, now we have an array of flyby objects. Something isn't right still. Ah, my return type. I can call it a list or a list of string values. And it looks like our error messages went away. All right, so let's break this down. Again, just like the if statement, uh, this time we have a for loop. Um, and it's going to iterate over a number of objects. So it's going to do the same thing, in, in our case, four times now, because there's four objects. Um, if we want to use any one of these objects in the code we're going to do repetitively, um, we reference this local variable called object. Um, it's going to be available to us because we declared it right here. And these are the objects in the larger list of objects. Okay, so we're going to print each of these over here. Okay. Notice how you explicitly declared 
flyby objects as a list of string, mm -hmm. but within the for loop, you declared it as var implicitly rather than explicitly. Yeah. Yeah. I, you I, can declare it explicitly in the for loop as well. Yeah. Or yeah. both implicitly. So which, which would this be? Instead of a var, if I wanted to be explicit, what is each object going to be? It should be a string. Okay, let's see. I'm gonna change that and then try to run it again. Just thinking, thinking, thinking. Okay, so it worked, that's right. For each string object in flyby objects, which is a list of string, print that particular string object. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good, good point out there about the, um, the data type. Because if I wanted to add something else here, like the number five, I no longer have a list of strings. Let's just be generic. Okay, now I have a, just a list of flyby objects. Um, but this might give us a problem. It looks like the, um, the compiler isn't giving us any um, error message right now. <laughs> the ahead of time compiler or whatever it is. Um, so maybe it hasn't evaluated that what this is going to be. Uh, but let's, let's see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> so the first four worked and the last one errored. Mm. Okay. It's not a subtype of string. So I'm kind of curious, what if we put five at the beginning? Would it error and continue to print everybody else? Or would it cause everything to stop? Okay. It ah, it, it executes sequentially. Mm -hmm. Now, this is an example I, I watched in one of the um, Flutter tutorials I was watching, the uh, one by Angel Yu, I think it was. She uh, talks about the um, using try catch that, to catch errors. Because um, sometimes it's like, okay, you could wrap a try catch loop in this um, to catch the error, but what's, what difference does it really make? And it's, it's for things like this. Maybe we want to, we'll say, um, I guess you do a try catch inside here. This is a little advanced, so a little detour. So what we'll do is we'll say, let's try to print it first. Uh, otherwise, we'll catch an error. And then print the error, I guess. Oops, and we probably need parentheses. Okay. This way, we can still print it like it's being printed over here, um, but we'll we'll be catching it and printing it explicitly, so we can we can keep going. Um, it's a missing curly brace after the print e clause. Oh snap! Thank you. There I probably deleted it when I was trying to format everything. Hmm. I didn't like that. That's interesting, isn't it? You think it's because it's in the for loop and it needs to be outside? I think so, because within the for loop signature, you're explicitly stating that the object is a string. Okay. So what we'll do is okay. okay. Now we want to print our object. Here's where we catch the error. Print the error. Okay. So just to be clear, the for loop is wrapped in the try block, and any error is going to pop out of there, and we're still going to print it, but then the thing should still keep operating. In Dart, do you have to? declare the type of the error object? That's a good question. 
I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, this is just kind of like all errors, I think. So right now, I the don't... The printout is white rather than red. So I feel like something happened behind the scenes. Yeah, like it's printing it, but for some reason it's not still going. Um, yeah, I don't know. We'll uh, hopefully figure this out when we get to the... Aaron, section. try another test. Put five at the back of the list. Okay. But change um, nothing else from the code. Let's run it and see what happens. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. It did catch the error slash exception and print it out. Cool. You think it did do that? Because if I comment this out and it's just running this, that turns red that time. Right. That's what ah, there you go. The wording. The previous said a specific type of exception, but this time it said uncaught error. Yeah. Oh, good point. Yeah, it's it's uncaught because we're not catching it. <laughs> it's just an error that we didn't expect. Unexpected error, I guess. But now we're we're printing the error type. Okay. Ah, that's cool. a type error. Cool. Yeah. So there's some way we don't know yet because we're not familiar enough with it to catch an error and print it, but keep going. Um, yeah, so we'll visit that another day. But we learned a little bit about printing the error at least, which is kind of cool. That was a good suggestion, Jim. Okay, so again, this could either be an object if we wanted to go up a level in class hierarchy. Um, so we're not uh, throwing an error anymore. Or we could try dynamic, which I think says don't check the, the object type. Or again, we can say var and just let, um, let the program figure it out. There we go. Cool. I think in this case, var is probably the best best thing to you var, to use var object and flyby objects. Um, so if this was Ruby, what we would do is something like flyby objects dot each do, and then we would have that object would do something like that. We'd have an in block, and then our way to print something is puts and you can just say puts object and again you don't need semicolons you don't need uh, parentheses you just say for each one of those do something and that this is the difference in how you pass the object whereas like here's how you have your local variable object there pretty cool so that's kind of the cool. difference. very nice what else did we have Oh yeah, this one. Um, we can do this for okay. So we no longer have flyby objects, but we do have months. Now, if I run this, will it do something? Okay. So printed out one through 12, these are the number of the months. Um, when, I, when I first read this, I was thinking like, well, don't months have to be defined? Like months equals some array, like January, yada, yada, yada. But I guess not because this month can really just be like a, uh, a number. If we were doing like algebra or um, whatever math class you learn this sort of thing in, you just have a variable. Um, so we start out with a, um, again, our for loop. We have our parentheses with our little conditions inside of it. So instead of being object oriented, um, instead we just have like pure numbers, raw integers. Um, you can't have a double here because I don't think. Let's see if that, 
wizardry will work. Okay, that does work. It starts at that. Maybe it doubles encompass integers, so yeah. logically it should work. Yeah, but it's not printing like 1.0. I don't know. That is cool that that works, I guess. What if I put it at var instead of int? It was originally int. Put it at var. Okay. So it kind of figures it out. Um, yeah. So um, for anybody that's never seen this before, you start out with one. And while n is less than 12, less than or equal to 12, you just print it. So that's why one is first printed. And then this little third thing after the semicolon increments it. Uh, and this looks a lot like, I think JavaScript does it just like this, or maybe they use commas between. JavaScript uses semicolons as well. Not so, yeah. So this, is, this comes from the C language, right? This is like inherited from C, I believe. Yep. So I've seen that. Okay. Instead of N plus plus in the third clause, mm -hmm. you can say N plus equals to. Are you, we can use plus equals? Plus equals whatever. Let's see. Okay. Add two by two this time. One, three, five, seven, nine, eleven. 11. Okay. And then once it goes to 13, it's like, hey, 13 is greater than 12. We're not going to print anymore. And it exits the for loop. Very nice. Okay. So you had the n plus plus or the n plus equals one. You also do n equals n plus one. I do super do your assignment that way. Turns out you can. So that's cool. So you can do a lot of complex things here if you wanted to. Try in modulus two is double equal to zero. Let's print the even numbers. Uh, what do you want me to do that again? For the third clause, mm -hmm. try in modulus two is equal, equal to zero. Equal to zero? Equal equals zero. Like that. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And you're saying n equals that, that whole thing? Ah, uh, I'm trying to print out all the even numbers. Hmm. Yeah, I think we'd have to put the condition down in here. If n modulo 2 equals equals 0, then do something. Uh, and then increment it normally. Yeah, and just like a I one. Yeah. It's thinking really hard now. Maybe we broke it. Is that how you do modulo? It's really having a tough time, Jim. I think you broke Interesting. It. Time to follow That's up. usually how it's done in all the other languages. Let's Google Dart Modulo while we're at it. Okay. Give an example. It's weird notation. Maybe we got a stack overflow. Somebody will have an actual example. They do put spaces in it. I don't think we would have to do that. There it goes. Okay. That's crazy. Okay. Yeah, it takes a while for it to calculate. Yeah, maybe something's going on. Cool. 
very nice. So we just put into effect our for loop we learned about, our conditional flow, uh, and then finally uh, another print statement. So I think that's cool. And we learned about modulo in case somebody hadn't learned about that yet. Um, it's a math thing. I don't want to explain it. <laughs> okay. So that's that. Yeah, I think that's all we needed for that one. And then this last one here is this while loop. I'm also going to get rid of this. I'm going to reformat it so we can read it. Okay. So again, this is like the first one where we needed to find the year 2021. It is a variable. Okay. So while year is less than 2016, year plus equals one, and it's not printing anything. So um, it's not actually going to do anything. Also, this while loop will not it execute That's right. because the year is greater than 2016. Yeah, so let's try 2015. Also, this while loop might execute, but it's doing it behind the scenes since nothing is printed out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also depends where you put this. Print it before we increment it. Now we should get 2015. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is a, a while loop where it says while this thing is true, um, keep doing all this stuff. Whereas I think if you just replace this with an if, okay, it's, it's going to do it, but it's not going to keep doing it. So again, let's say we change that to 2010 and we have a while. So it's going to be like 2010 increment, 2011 increment, 2012. So we'll have 2010 through 2015 right here. Okay, like so. If we change it to an if though, so I just wanna draw attention to the fact that like they share the same like format, if you will. Um, and this is gonna be true, but it's only gonna be true once because the, the program flow is just gonna go straight down and be done after the first time. So they should print 2010, it'll increment the variable, but then we're not doing anything with it. Like so. In C sharp, there's a uh, flow control statement called a do while loop, where mm -hmm. it guarantees the execution of the loop at least one time. Mm -hmm. In Dart, I don't know if there's such thing as a do while loop, or if there's a way to modify a, the while loop to force the while loop to execute at least one time. Yeah, I don't know. That might be a, uh, a thing to read about on the um, some of the more advanced stuff. Mm. Or we could try to guess. Um, this is what I've seen from other programming languages where you have the do there, and then you have the condition. Exactly. Okay, so instead of having the condition here, we would just say do, print the thing, increment it. So for example, 2016. Add a semicolon. Yeah, right there. Okay. So we set the year to 2016. It's going to print it because it's going to do it at least once. It's going to increment it. Um, actually, let's do 2015 because that'll print it. That'll increment it to 2016. And then it'll be like, okay, after the fact, you're not less than 2016 anymore. So it should only print 2015 is the way I interpreted that. Ah, the computer. I guess a do while loop does exist in Dart. Fantastic. Yeah. And again, this is either identical to JavaScript or some C language. So if I type in JavaScript while, we should have an example. Yeah, it looks exactly the same pretty much. <laughs> right? I guess for the basic syntax, 
everybody has it. Most C level derivative languages has it. Yeah, yeah. What is um? What is Ruby? And again, this is something you really don't use all that much uh, in Ruby. Yeah, so that's what that's what a while looks like. You just have that condition again. They have a for loop you can use, um, and the do while. So loop is a key word you use. Loop do. Um, yeah. Different family. Cool. That's pretty easy. Control flow statements. Um, you know, with the if, else, if, and, and else, there's an alternative you can use with switching case. Um, that's also con comparable to other programming languages. Uh, there's ways to say break out of the loop or uh, skip it or, or continue. Some, some programming languages have next. Mm -hmm. um, continue on to the next iteration of the loop. Mm -hmm. Uh, this one I've seen a lot in documentation. They use assert. It looks like a testing keyword. Um, yes, I'm only familiar with assert when it comes to testing for C sharp. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see, so we'll go into functions next time. But if you wanted to go in depth into the control flow statements, they have um, an extended version. Right, where the else, and so we did that. Um, I think we did pretty much everything that was in the for loops and the object oriented for loop. We did while and do while, so that was good. And then there's other things like break, continue, switching case. Yeah. And then the last thing here was assert. And that one is new to me too. So this would be a, a cool one to go into depth on sometime. And then of course the exceptions that we, we ran into. Uh -huh. Save those for another day. Cool, next time let's dive into functions. Yep, next time we'll do functions. That'll be fun. His buzz. That's right. <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> so, anyways, all right. Great job, Jim. We'll see you next time. We'll see you guys next time. <laughs>